Thank you all for joining us uh, today. And um, this is a writing prompt for, I think I just, one other person chimed in, if you wouldn't mind just answering these on the side and we're not asking you to share it, but just to give some reflection, reflection and thought to these, these prompts. My name is Lisa Ingravera. I'm the Assistant Director of Administration and Academic Development in the Center for Community Engaged Learning. Um, thank you all for, for coming today and those, and thank you for joining the, the first two uh, sessions as well, if you were, were a part of those. Uh, we'll be able to share that shortly uh, as well. They were recorded. Um, today is, is definitely going to be uh, a little bit hard hitting and uh, we want you to know that there's nothing here that we intend to be used as harmful or and it is not in our intention to uh, to harm or bring harm, uh, but we do ask that you approach with an open mind. Um, that said, um, I'd like to in introduce Clarence Ball, who has been working with me on this particular um, session, uh, and um, I'll let him introduce himself and his background. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I won't I won't spend too much time on that, but my name is uh, Clarence Ball. I've been a faculty member at the Gabelli School of Business for about eight years now, and I'm also our Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Gabelli School of Business. Thank you, Clarence. Um, did uh, Did everybody have a moment to jot down some some notes? To these prompts. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So, Clarence, can we or uh, can we uh, advance our slides? Absolutely. If you didn't have a chance to answer the questions, you might have your cell phone close by and take pictures of some of the slides because some of the stuff is going to come at you uh, fairly quickly. Okay. Right. So, um, the topic for today is putting career personalists into action uh, for BIPOC students, a faculty workshop, and this will be facilitated by myself and also Lisa and Rivera. Um, here's our agenda for today. We'd like to do some acknowledgments and introductions. We've done that. Uh, we'd like to get into some diversity, equity, and inclusion terms and some ground rules to put a frame around our discussion. Uh, then we'd like to just go as in depth as we possibly can, uh, considering the amount of time that we have about the Black at Fordham IG posts. We've extracted a number of posts uh, that we think should be of concern for faculty. Uh, then we want to do a crash course in difficult conversations uh, with uh, some of the um, empirical literature concerning the topic, uh, primarily in the education space. Um, and then Lisa's going to share some, um, some of her best practices from the Center for Community Engaged Learning between faculty and student relationships. And we will end with uh, Ibram Kendi's take on allyship and then some final takeaways. Okay. So uh, ground rules and um, let's give it to Lisa. Yes, um, we know it's important to have some ground rules. So um, please come to the discussion with a sense of openness. Uh, minimize your distractions, cell phones, emails. Uh, stay engaged and guard against shutting down. Um, that's an important one. Please maintain con confidentiality. Avoid judgments um, about each other and about yourselves. So be kind to yourself as well. Strive to accept each other's perceptions as their truth. Uh, have empathy for every single member of the group, even if they express an opinion that is different from yours. Very good. Okay. So let's uh, begin with some of our terms. So diversity, um, as we define it at the Gabelli School of Business, and I think at the broader institution, is not just about race and ethnicity. Wow. It's important to know that, all right? So uh, it encompasses also values, personalities, uh, abilities, cultures, uh, genders, uh, faiths, uh, socioeconomic statuses, sexual orientations, and so on, all right? So when you hear the word diversity, you don't just automatically think race and ethnicity because it's a broad umbrella. Uh, the next thing here is cultural competency. Cultural competency is really the ability to communicate across cultures. And so each person, every individual should be striving to be more culturally competent, all right? Cultural proficiency is a little bit different. It's not for a person, but rather an institution or an organization. So it's a set of policies that really undergird the institution in the interest of equity to make sure that in Fordham University's uh, case, that all students, uh, faculty and staff are having an equitable experience and the policies behind the university would, uh, would make that 
uh, a possibility. I'm gonna give it over to Lisa. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, underrepresented groups are subsets of population that hold a historically smaller percentage of representation in the field or institution. Uh, examples of that are women, African-Americans, Latino, Latin, Latinx and STEM fields, men in social work or nursing fields. Implicit bias occurs when subtle attitudes about groups of people exist without conscious awareness. So consider stereotypes when you think about implicit bias. Um, bias incident, uh, an intentional or unintentional act targeted at a person or group expressing hostility based on gender, race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or disability. Um, examples of this are epithets, slurs, degrading language, intimidation, coercion, or harassment. Okay, so we're going to take a deep dive uh, now into the Black at Fordham post. Uh, I'll take uh, the first uh, five minutes or so of this, and then I'll give it back over to Lisa to do uh, her exercise that she's planned for this, okay? So uh, first thing uh, that we should acknowledge is that uh, there are a lot of scholars at Fordham University that are really grappling with hard research questions around the Black at Fordham post, okay? Uh, before you is one such uh, hypothesis, uh, and it is, how might we harness very good. Uh, digital counter spaces to support the resilience and empowerment of racial uh, minority students and inclusive practices for allies. All right. This hypothesis was crafted uh, by Dr. Ralph uh, Baca uh, from the Communication and Media Studies uh, area um, and also his research uh, colleague, uh, Jenny Park Taylor. And they also have two uh, doctoral candidates um, that are under their research umbrella that have been helping them with this project, all right? Their project uh, is really coming in four phases. The first, uh, they did a public co-design of uh, workshops with students as facilitators and also participants. That was in 2019. In 2020, they conducted 11 in-depth interviews to collect some more qualitative data. And also in 2020, they did uh, four additional workshops with 19 students, and that brings us current to this year, where they are looking at 421 artifacts uh, from the Black at Fordham Instagram post. And these are some of the artifacts that they have extracted and also uh, parent codes and child codes from their coding analysis, all right? So parent code, administrative uh, trust, uh, child code, accountability around racial tensions. I uh, apologize for reading these to you directly from the, from the slide, but this is kind of the best way for us to get the points across of the students, all right? So uh, Fordham administration upholds a culture where white students are rarely held sufficiently accountable for their actions. This is coming for, from a student. Uh, next child code, authentic engagement. I have heard uh, leadership and administrators say that Fordham will never engage authentically with BLM, racism, social justice issues of relevance. Um, and uh, in depth in educating our students, uh, nor building authentic relationships with people who live in the Bronx. Uh, next quote extracted by Ralph Baca and his team, faculty and administrators do not actually see a lack of black representation on this campus as an issue. And they do not see how it affects the lives of students for day to day. But frankly, I do not think that they care to acknowledge it, at least not until pressure was put on them, okay? Next parent code, microaggressions, all right? Child codes uh, under microaggressions. First one is microaggressions and power dynamics. Uh, one student in class, uh, not enough uh, syllabi were passed around during class, so I went up to the professor and I asked, can I get one? He asked for my name, I told him. He went down the class list and read my last name out loud and then asked me, where are you from? When I told him, he then laughed and asked, are you, ICE? are you in ISIS? I was literally shocked and I did not know how to respond. Next, uh, I spoke to the swim coach for an opportunity to try out for the team. I came prepared uh, with my times and videos of my past competitions, only for him to look up and down at me, uh, look, at, look up and down with a puzzled, puzzled face. Uh, you actually swim? And he shrugged his shoulders, another student, that was at the pool said that there was little to no chance that he would entertain giving me a chance. The team has a look. And I guess that I did not fit that look, all right? 
uh, under the same parent code of microaggressions, uh, child code normalizing othering, okay? Me and two black uh, girlfriends went to a pregame at a white teammate's apartment. When we left the pregame, a male student drunkenly and belligerently uh, and white leans out of his window and yells, black sluts matter. Shocked, we then asked him to repeat it, in which he did without hesitation. Next. Uh, let's see, I participated in an urban plunge and it hurt me deeply every time. Uh, white students would remark on how disgusting the Bronx and its residents were. Uh, they made me feel like scum. During uh, the roommate agreement signing while discussing guest policies, my white roommates very aggressively said that they would not be bringing any locals to the dorm. Uh, I wanted to scream that they were uh, living with one, but Fordham made me feel like I did not have a voice. Very good. Last theme uh, from this, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Uh, systemic influences, okay, uh, in the surrounding community, all right? The gates need to be torn down. I've had guards ask me if I was a student after seeing me swipe, uh, physically block me from entering the university, and force me to justify where I was going. But none of this would bother me so much if the treatment of white of the white student body wasn't so radically different. I, I'll add a personal anecdote and say that I've been stopped at least 10 or 15 times at various gates and different points of campus. I see other BIPOC people raising their hands about that. So I'm going to give it over to, to Lisa to conclude some of our uh, uh, findings concerning this. Yes, thank you so much, Clarence. Um, again, just to, to bring you a little bit of context, this is uh, the the impetus for this whole series was to bring the, the college experience, to bring the classroom experience to life from the perspective of the student. Uh, and then because I wanted to see um, students have a place of belonging, because I wanted students to feel like they had um, support and that you know uh, anything that they can do was, was going to contribute to a success, a graduation success, student success, retention. Um, that being said, when the, the IG post started to pop up in these campaigns, um, it really concerned me. And so I wanted to bring, bring life and give it um, breath. Uh, and right here we have, I just want to take a look, is, is the number of complaints by theme. Um, that was one of the important things I wanted to, to say and acknowledge to, to faculty is how many times do we hear these words come up in these posts? Racism, 47 times. Se sexism, 32 ableism 23, institutional neglect, neglect 20. Um, there's just so much rich information here that we could use to, to create a more equitable classroom. And we've evidenced it in, with the issues that we can now address. The next slide. 42% of black respondents experience discrimination compared to only 10% of white respondents. Um, what I'd like to do right now, I'm gonna read this out loud, but um, for anybody in the audience, I, I'd like for this to be a little bit interactive, um, I, which means that I'm gonna ask you um, each just to popcorn and read um, one of these slides as we go along because they're quotes from students. Um, if you feel, if, if you're not ready to, I'll jump in, Clarence will jump in, but I think it might be good for everyone to read it and so that they can hear it out loud and so can everyone else. Um, as far as races, this first slide, racism and ableism, uh, accuse a student of cheating off a white student because they had the same answers and gave them a worse grade than the white student. Next slide. This is where I'd like for you, if you wouldn't mind, if just jump in and um, read the slide, please. I can get started. Um, sexism. Asked an international student why she spoke such a good English, assumed an article on cybersecurity would be written by a man, and undermined students' varying perspective on text. Thank you. Sexism too, did well in explaining the historic roots of white supremacy, but said the N word and doubled down when called out in class, made a few line crossing jokes about rape and other sensitive issues, admitted in the first day of class that they intended to make offensive jokes the whole semester. All right, uh, institutional neglect and uh, microaggressions. 
a faculty member belittled a student for trying to graduate early for economic reasons. A same faculty member insinuated that if the student was working an unpaid in internship, it was because they weren't worth the money. Uh, spoke over the student during uh, meetings on race. This is another one of those, uh, those long posts. So we tried to redact uh, the names uh, here. I can paraphrase this one. It's this. It's it's um, has to do with this bubble juice, uh, or or as it says here. And so the student came in with this this bubble tea or juice and was asked where did they get it if they got it around here or not. And and, and it was uh, the student answered Chinatown, and then suggested that um, uh, I heard they sell some bush meat there. So referring to that animals are being used as food in this. Um, in Chinatown, and then apparently the the faculty member kind of tried to shrug it off and, and jokingly, uh, already making the entire class incredibly uncomfortable. Um, this is this is, uh, and then the next one is uh, uh, let's see. Uh, this is why I hate to hate when students do tests in pencil. I mean, I I my zero as a six. So, you know, admonishing somebody for their handwriting in that moment. Um, during the test, I go up to ask someone clarifying questions. I can't help you is, is the response. Um, yeah, unfair, but I don't do any, I, yeah, I wish. I, the classroom has definitely um, is shown us a lot of grief and struggle um, and these, these really pointed remarks. Can we have the next slide? Uh, anti-black uh, racist. Other people can jump in here. I'm sorry, I can't see all yeah. of, all of the boxes. Anybody care to read uh, anti-black racism? Oh, in a class, go ahead. Uh, anti-black racism in a class about urban history and neighborhood change. A Bronx native and student of color was deterred from speaking their actual experiences through tone policing by both professor and fellow student, and actively disbelieved when sharing their personal experiences with gentrification. Wow. Uh, com comparing uh, racist experiences. Uh, somebody else care to read that? Would invalidate students' first generation American experience by saying no one had it as bad as the Italians. Would not give student an extension when student asked because of their issues with anxiety and depression. Told them you have to get over it. Uh, comparing racist experiences again and validate the experience of first generation Americans uh, experiences by claiming that Italians and she was Italian had it the worst. Uh, mental health and this is another one of those long posts I'm going to ask uh, Lisa to paraphrase here. Yeah, this is um, something that happens a lot is is when students um, they seek help uh, and, and when they're struggling in classes and are met with, um, with professors who ask them to prove it. Um, when it comes to mental health, that's um, it's incredibly discouraging to have someone tell you, prove your mental health is not okay, um, instead of offering some help. So it's, it's in the classroom where students are feeling like they're not being taken seriously, and there's no compassion being shown um, for this. So in this case right here, not, you know, being told that they have to, you know, prove it before they can get any, any resources or extensions of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, homo, homophobia. Um, would anybody care to, to paraphrase uh, this one? Repeatedly dead named a trans student after learning their new name discussed trans people as if they were a hypothetical thought exercise rather than real people ask prying questions about students sexuality and gender identity when writing assignments about them very good racism uh, again somebody else could read them sure Racism, an administrator responsible for students is quoted as admitting to threatening a student who was the victim of a hate crime with expulsion for continuing to pursue the complaint. Okay, uh, racism again. Um, 
Somebody care to read this one? I'll hop in. Uh, student asked a dean to address racist comments, insisted that student confront themselves, confront, I guess, their accuser themselves, despite the fact that she was still responsible for that student's grades, and that made the student feel uncomfortable confronting her. Very cool. Okay, so that, uh, that, that rounds out a lot of the more um, stringent uh, uh, posts. Um, I'd, I'd like to give it to Lisa to conclude her section. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. I, I wanted to say to you all, thank you first and foremost for reading yes. um, and listening and, and capturing what we really hoping you are capturing. These are our students' voices. Um, and we try to to deliver it in a way um, that that all of us can understand that this is this is a voice that needs to be heard. And I hope that we can adjust um, and, and help other faculty and our students not feel so um, so attacked in the in the classroom so that it disrupts their learning so that it just disrupts their their ability to ask for help um, as well. So um, this was the, the first of. of um, uh, the Instagram posts uh, being presented here today, and there's lots of research going on about, around it across campus now, which is wonderful, so more people will understand and hear and see. Um, from here, though, um, we're going to, uh, Clarence is going to talk about difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, I don't know if Ralph Baca is here or any of his research oh. team, but thank you to him for yeah, thank you. sharing uh, that initial data uh, in his analysis with us. So I'm gonna uh, kind of go quickly here through difficult uh, conversations. Uh, I promised you that we would continue to do some journaling. So uh, these are the next set of questions that I'd like for you to answer. And again, one sentence per question is good enough for us. What is the most difficult conversation that you've had about race? Somebody might say this one. <laughs> <laughs> next question. Um, at any point, did you shut down either internally or externally? Okay, and then how do you model uh, scholarly or professional behavior in a difficult conversation about race? So you might take a minute to put a sentence uh, for each of those questions, All right, and you might do like a screenshot or take a picture with your phone as we go into the next uh, next portion here. Okay, all right. So uh, let's see here. Let's talk about uh, diversity again. All right. Uh, I'd like to put a frame around our discussion by acknowledging uh, the dimensions of diversity. There are both primary and secondary dimensions of diversity. Primary dimensions are the things that we can see. So you can see, you know, maybe how old someone is, maybe how they choose to identify by gender. You might even be able to tell their racial or ethnic heritage. Secondary dimensions of diversity are a little bit different. These are things that you cannot see. So you might not be able to tell a person's socioeconomic status or their first language or their level of education. And yet all of these things dictate our approach to a race conversation and the approach that the audience has, whoever we're speaking to, the approach that they will have in a conversation about race. And when you marry the primary dimensions with the second dim secondary dimension, that's where you get intersectionality. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. So, uh, that said, let's just talk a little bit about how the mind works, because it, it would be, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't do that uh, in a conversation about race. So since you were a baby, right, you've been collecting a pool of data based on what you see, what you taste, what you smell, the things that you hear around the kitchen table as you were a child, right? So all of that is your pool of data, and you have made observations about that data um, not only on your own, but also listening to your sphere of influence. So the people around you, their thoughts around these conversations, right? From those observations, you then select data and, so, and assign meaning to it. So every time I see a person from this group, this, this means, right? And that's how we get assumptions. And those assumptions, often stereotypes, if we think quickly, can end in conclusions. Those conclusions then informed our belief systems. Scary at the belief system level because what we believe we teach, okay? And based on our belief systems, we then inform our actions. Now that I believe this, I need to cross the street when, when people and a person from this group comes, right? It informs our actions, okay? So that is the ladder of, of, influ of uh, influence there. I'd like to introduce you to a scholar here. This is Dr. Mazarin Banaji. 
Uh, she's the chair of the psychology department at Harvard University. Uh, before that, she spent her time um, at Yale psychology department. And she, of course, has her PhD from The Ohio State University. Now, uh, Dr. Banaji wrote the book Blind Spot with her research partner, Dr. Greenwald, New York Times bestseller. Everybody was reading this book because they wanted to have a lead in into the diversity conversation that taught them about the mind. Here's some of her findings, right? Uh, what her and Dr. Greenwald find is that the mind is both reflective and automatic. The reflective part of your mind is conscious. It recalls memory, uh, situations, scenarios, things that you've gone through, media that you have consumed. The conscious part of your mind is about 10% of your daily thoughts, about 10%, all right? The automatic part of your mind is the subconscious. It's about 90% of your thoughts that are governing your behaviors, your beliefs, and your actions. And because it is automatic, it is not uh, susceptible to analysis, but it is instead responsive to instinct. So it becomes an instinct, right? To either uh, gravitate toward people in your in-group or to gravitate away from people that are in your out-group, right? And to make decisions based on that. Here's an example from the book so that you understand her thinking. Uh, Joan A is in excellent health. Dr. M advises Joan against a routine cholesterol check. Joan insists on a cholesterol check. Test results find that Joan's cholesterol is so high that she needs a drug regimen. Dr. M then admits that he believed that women are at lower risk for heart attacks than men, okay? So this is his subconscious, right? Making conscious decisions that are affecting um, somebody from an out group. In this case, it's gender, all right? Okay, triggers for unconscious bias. When do these stereotypes, when do these things um, kind of jump out at us? When we are under stress, okay? When we are under time constraints, when there's a clock up against us, when we are multitasking, teaching a lecture, reading our notes, monitoring the class, taking the role, all right? When there is a lack of information, some student raises their hand and brings a topic into the conversation that you had not planned to discuss. Okay, when having mental overload and fatigue, and I can't imagine that any of us are not having mental overload and fatigue in the middle of this pandemic environment, right? The point I'm trying to drive home here is that unconscious bias, the classroom for the professor is a cesspool for unconscious bias because we are often under stress and under time constraints and multitasking, you understand? Okay, so let's go a step further here, right? I've got a practice exercise, and this is something that uh, I've taken from uh, Dr. Mazarin Banaji and her implicit association test at Harvard. If you are familiar, you know that the implicit association test um, comes in various forms about gender, homosexuality, um, people that speak English as a second language. It, it takes you through all of those tests, okay? Um, so I've got one, um, and what I'd like for you to do is I'm gonna present you a word and then I want you to write down the first thought that comes to mind when I say this word, okay? First word is college. First word that comes to mind when I say college, okay? Next word is black college. First word that comes to mind when I say black college. Next word is church. First word that comes to mind when I say church. Next word is black church. First word that comes to mind when you think of a black church. The next word is doctor. First word that comes to mind when you think of doctor. Next word is black doctor. First thought that comes to mind. Okay, next, company. First word that comes to mind when I say company. Last word is black owned company. First thought that comes to mind when I say black owned company. So I, I promised that we wouldn't make this talk about race. And yet, if we're looking critically at Dr. Uh, Banaji's work, I have to tell you that her most salient findings from the implicit association test at Harvard were 
her test about race. So she would put a research uh, participant in front of a computer screen. Um, in that computer screen, they would put an image up of a white person and then an image up of a black person. And then they would have to recall their first thought, okay? And in most instances, even when the research participant was black, there was a preference for white, okay? I just wanna just give you a glimpse into the research. And if you look at some of the things that you wrote down, differences between college and black college, differences between church and black church, then you might see how some of these things are operationalized, all right? Next scholar I'd like to introduce you to is Dr. Richard Valencia. Dr. Richard Valencia uh, is at the Columbia Teachers College, and he uh, gives us um, in, in the literature this term deficit thinking, okay? Deficit thinking, um, really, he, he merges three models uh, from historic uh, literature in the education space. Uh, first, the genetic pathology model. Next, the culture of poverty model. And the at-risk model. Okay, and again, contemporary deficit thinking. This article was published in 1997 by Dr. Valencia, all right? So let's talk about the genetic pathology uh, model, all right? This model held currency in the medical uh, academic literature from 1830 to from, I'm sorry, 1890 to 1930, all right? So in medical journals, there was this thought that inferiority was passed down from genetic code, okay? Now, this thought lost currency in the 1930s and we realized that the science didn't align, so it's, it doesn't make scientific sense. But you might think about uh, the fact that academic literature builds on itself in the same way that seminal cases in law build on cases uh, from the Supreme Court. So some of the residue of this genetic pathology model is still in some current literature that is in circulation, which is why Dr. Valencia brings it back to the forefront. The next thing is the culture of poverty model, okay? In the culture of poverty model, it is believed that people from certain uh, ethnic groups, all right, come from an inherent culture of poverty. So they have poor investment uh, strategies, welfare recipients. They have bad family units, unstable families, unwed mothers, teen parents, okay? They have bad work orientation, unreliable, poor work ethics. And then last, there's this view of pleasure thing, right? Um, alcohol all the time, drugs all the time, sex all the time, party all the time. You might see that um, in some of the some of the hip hop, uh, you know, music. And so, I'm sorry if I don't have a, <laughs> if I don't have rhythm. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the next thing is the at risk model. At risk model, and in the at risk uh, model, this is a fairly recent seminal article by James in 2012, right? Um, but in the at risk model, all right. It says that uh, youth from certain groups, so that would be like our students if they identify a certain way, are, in, in some instances, immigrants, fatherless, troublemakers, athletes, or underachievers. So that would be like, you know, for example, faculty looking at students that are young, fitting the at-risk model, and then thinking that these students automatically fit into these five, these five categories. Okay, all right, uh, let's go here. Last scholar I'm gonna introduce you to, and this is Dr. Daryl Wing Su, okay? Dr. Daryl Wing Su is also at the Columbia Teachers College. He coins the term microaggressions for us, okay? He wrote a book recently, uh, Facilitating Difficult Race Discussions, and in it, he really uh, talks about five ineffective and five successful conversation strategies, particularly about race. The first one, uh, is in ineffective strategies is to do nothing. So that would be like a difficult conversation arises in the classroom, you know that it is race related and the faculty decides to sidestep the conversation and talk about something different, all right? Uh, Sidetracking the conversation, bringing up another topic that is related but not as stringent. Um, appeasing the participants, which is something that they can feel if you're kind of going through the motions because you know it's the right thing to say, but there's no real personal connection or empathy for the student's story, okay? Next thing, terminating the discussion completely. We, we're not gonna talk about, about, about that. We're not, that, that we weren't talking about that. Let's, let's move on, right? Mm -hmm. The last thing is to become defensive. 
is to become defensive, to get angry, to lash out as a, as a, as a means to get the student or whoever it is to, to retreat in this instance. Next thing would be successful conversation uh, strategies. So um, understanding your own racial or cultural identity. And we all have a starting point or should for who we are um, and where we come from racially or ethnically. Next, acknowledge and be open to admitting biases. Mm. Okay, and in America, we all have them. Racism is not either you are or you are not. Instead, it is a continuum. So you can be on the lower end of the spectrum, right? But it is not either I am or I am not racist, okay? Validate and facilitate discussions of feelings. I understand how you feel. I feel like, right? Because your feelings are valid too, no matter what your, your race or culture is, all right? Control the process and not the content of the race talk. We saw some, uh, some IG posts where, where people were trying to control the content within the conversation as opposed to controlling the process. Last, validate, encourage, and express admiration, uh, ad express ad admiration and appreciation for, for participants who speak when it feels unsafe to do so. So if people have the stones to say something about how they feel, particularly if, they if they're the only person in the room or one of a very few people in the room, you should encourage that and validate their experiences as their as their truth. Okay. All right. So, how to receive uh, feedback? All right. Um, if an instance occurs and you're in a classroom and and you you know the ineffective strategies and you know the the appropriate strategies, right? Here's some additional tools on how to receive feedback if somebody is personally calling you out, and that has happened before in some of those IG posts. First thing, stop your first reaction. Put some, put some time between um, you know, the action and the reaction, okay? Uh, remember the benefit of getting feedback. None of us would be where we are in our careers if people weren't giving us critical feedback. So we have to acknowledge that, that students are also valuable in that way. Uh, listen for understanding and not to respond, okay? Say thank you, of course ask questions to deconstruct the feedback. And for this one, you might not do it in the moment, and that's okay. You might say, you know, I'm, I'm hearing you and I understand I'm not quite prepared to have that conversation right now, but if I can get back to you next class, or if I can email you separately and we can talk offline, that is okay. That is much better than ignoring the issue, okay? Last, please request some time to follow up, right? So not only did you acknowledge that I'm doing this behavior, but can you give me some additional feedback on how I've improved? All right, okay. All right, so uh, discussion, uh, we've got a few more questions. And again, you just answer these questions in your, in your notes and you don't have to say anything out loud. Uh, so how do we develop a critical awareness of who we are ethnically and culturally? Why is it important to have a cultural starting point for ourselves as faculty members? How do our lived experiences and our sphere of influence, this is the people that we are surrounding ourselves with, the people that we eat dinner with, the people that are in our neighborhoods that we consider to be our, our neighbors and our friends, right? How, how does our sphere of influence impact our conversations on race? So you can answer one sentence uh, per question. You might take a picture or a screenshot of that. And that concludes uh, my section and I'm gonna give it back over to, to Lisa. Thank you so much, Clarence. That was really, really impactful and helpful. Hello again, everyone. Uh, I just want to uh, bring you into the center a little bit um, as we are, are actively seeking ways to bring this faculty student relationships into a more constructive space. Um, and the ways that we um, can do that. Can I have a next slide? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, just as a reminder, um, the mission of the center is to bridge Fordham University and our neighboring communities uh, in, in, through experiential learning, research, and civic engagement. Um, and our vision is to engage every member of the university as active citizens in the alleviation of poverty and the uh, promotion of, of justice and protection of human rights. Um, and our values are listed there, which is, is definitely all the components of extra, um, community engaged learning and scholarship. Um, next page. Mm -hmm. 
what is community engaged learning? I, I remember when I first arrived at Fordham, that was like the biggest question we asked everybody. What is your take on that? What is community engaged learning? Um, and uh, you know, you'd be surprised how many different answers uh, come up from that. But here I have um, very, very specific criteria for, for community engaged learning as um, Julie Gaffney and work groups and other faculty have put together, address a specific community interest problem or public uh, concern, include working with and learning from a community partner, which is incredibly important. It's work with, not for, um, and learning from a community partner because they bring value to the table as well. Connect and integrate community engaged experiences. Faculty, any chance, any chance you have an opportunity to connect your, your class with a um, a community partner, an organization, be it nonprofit or for-profit, a school, but, um, we encourage you to do that because that also creates a better uh, um, faculty-student experience in the classroom. Include structured, documented, critical reflection. Reflection cannot be done um, uh, just by itself, and it should always be at the end of any exercise you're doing uh, with students. Have the next. Um, and in here, this is just uh, um, a list of resources for you. And I'm going to ask um, for um, Candace, my colleague, if you wouldn't mind dropping some of those links in the chat for you. I bring this to you because it is a tremendous effort on our part to link and connect faculty with the community in order for our students to have a more well-rounded experience at Fordham. Uh, we can't do this without faculty uh, participating from this lens. And so uh, one of the, my findings in, in research is, says that uh, if you give faculty the option and the room and the space to use these classroom experiences to advance their own communities of learning, their own communities of teaching, as well as their research, um, that more faculty will, will participate. And so um, we want to encourage the faculty to come into the center to communicate with Julie and I to see how you might connect your class with with communities and 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 engage in a more in a more thoughtful fashion, um, while again keeping uh, keeping an eye towards student success and retention. Um, in our pages, we have uh, lots of open partnerships. Please, we encourage you to check that out as well. Um, and we use an asset-based community development approach, which means you have strengths out there. All of our community partners have strengths. We don't come in to try to fix something. We want to we want to come in and support what you are already doing, and that is the basis for every class, every student, every faculty member that engages with our community. And I want to just make sure that we understand that. Um, and then uh, I put something I got is a link for the blog here as well, which is, is I encourage everyone to check out college access, which is, is um, something that is incredibly uh, fruitful for connecting faculty with students in, uh, in this particular program that I have mentioned here is history makers. Um, faculty work very closely with uh, student mentors in order to deliver a, a college level um, academic rigorous program uh, to high school students in the Bronx. And every, every mentor who has come out, come from, from this program who had participated has really expressed how, in, how, how good it was, how, how they felt belonging and connection with the professor because they did work so close together on, on, on reading material, on how they're gonna deliver reading material, on learning presentation skills, on learning more about Bronx history. And it all came from their interactions with faculty and then as well as being mentors to the mentees in the program. It's an incredible model that I, I would encourage um, across the, the university. Uh, once again, can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is, I just wanted to bring this, this quote out. I've, like I said, I've been doing some of my own, own research. Completing a higher education degree is an achievement not done in isolation. And that is the important piece there, which is why I continue to uh, encourage more community engaged learning and scholarship uh, and projects. Um, and next slide. So um, this is long, I'm not gonna um, read it all, all, all the way through, but it, it once again uh, brings me to how uh, we need to support our faculty development and, and give them opportunities um, for their own research and the advancement of their courses. 
Um, and acting as mentors in the process is, is something that, that we would like to encourage faculty to do as well. And one statement in here that is important uh, instructors are a source of influence on students' self-efficacy, as perceived teacher expectations have a relationship with student attitudes about course performance. And we seen we saw in the IG post that it was uh, forcing a student to confront a, a, a difficult professor um, is not is not a help to the self-efficacy. It's also not, it doesn't give you, give a student a sense of faith and hope in, in their performance in the class as going to be perceived by a faculty member. So building the relationship within the classroom and, and through community engaged work, I, I really sincerely believe will curtail some of these attitudes in the classroom from prevailing. Next slide. Um, and if I may just write quick, cause we have only 10 minutes uh, remaining. I, I want to point out here, um, this is something that I've adapted in, in my own research. The first two columns are um, Saracen and Milin Chavez, uh, who came up with um, questions and, and that students were going to respond to about how they felt a sense of belonging in the class and on college campuses. And they're using um, shared emotional connection as, 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 a, as a theme here. And like I said, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but what I was able to do here was to demonstrate how we were efficiently achieving a sense of belonging from students through these different program models. Um, and we can um, share that with you at, at another time. But again, it's, it's evidenced 100% of our mentors, our Fordham student mentors felt a great connection with each other, with faculty, with the community at large. Next slide. And I'm gonna pass this back over to um, Clarence. Um, you tell us where we, where we stand with time. We're at 4.51. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think I can get this done in two to three minutes and then we can open it up uh, for questions, okay? Okay, great, so, thank you. Very, very briefly, this is the Ally Continuum. So this is a really good place for faculty to, to find where they are. So apathetic would be, you know, no real understanding of the issues, aware would be like, I know some basic concepts, actively active would be like you, you're really well informed and you're also seeking information and an advocate would be someone who is, you know, actively anti-racist. So like they are routinely and proactively championing uh, inclusion, all right? Uh, all of this has been borrowed from Dr. Ibram uh, Kendi's book on how to be an anti-racist. So step one uh, for people that are looking for quick steps, understand the definition of racist. I can't tell you how many people say, I'm not a racist. Well, what does it mean? I'm scratching my head, I don't know. So uh, what is it, all right? It is both a noun and an adjective. So you could be an inherent racist, but most people are not, right? Or you could do something or say something that is racist within a particular moment, right? Uh, so it's important to understand the differences between those two things, all right? Uh, next, stop saying that I am not racist. Again, it's just not scientific. So racism is a continuum. You can be on the lower end of the spectrum and most people probably are, right? Um, but the rest of the spectrum is still there too. So you should be aware of that. Uh, next, uh, identify uh, racial inequities and disparities. So if a student says something in the class and maybe you think it's the wrong time to say that, you might say the statistics behind what he said are accurate or something like that, right? So the, you acknowledge what the inequities are, uh, confront racist ideas that you've held or continue to hold. And this might not be something that you do out loud, but internally you should think critically about things that maybe you've thought previously or that you think now and challenge those, those, those assertions, okay? Uh, five, understand how your anti-racism needs to be intersectional. So it's not just race and ethnicity, but going back to primary and secondary dimensions of diversity, how these things are connected and how we can use uh, multiple identities to, uh, to other someone, like if they are black and gay, for example, all right? Okay, uh, number six, champion anti-racist ideas and policies. So continue to promote the people that are doing this critical work. And uh, there's some food for thought here. You can take a screenshot of that if you, if you so choose to. 
um, and we'll go quickly to get to question and answer. So screenshot going once, going twice. All right, very good. Uh, next thing, actions that you can take now. I really recommend if you haven't done so, that you take the implicit association test at Harvard, okay? So we can send you a link to the implicit association test again. There are tests on race and gender and sexuality and religion and so on. But I think if you are trying to get a better understanding for this Black at Fordham uh, stuff and all of those artifacts, you should take the IAT test on, on race. So I will conclude it about there and then we can open the floor for questions.